Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Matthew. I'll be reading chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Today I'm reading the NIV translation, and this is the Transfiguration text. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think most everybody knows that last Sunday was one of the big days on our secular calendar. Super Bowl Sunday. And for a very, very rare thing, actually, the team I pulled for won. That's highly unusual. Um, but I'm calling today Super Sunday. We remember, we remember this day to commemorate the day that God spoke to Jesus' inner core of disciples. This far and away eclipses the circle. It gave added assurance to Jesus' inner circle because they're soon going to be facing overwhelming struggles with doubt as Jesus is arrested and crucified. You know, this is the third epiphany in the New Testament. The day officially ends the season of epiphany. The first was, of course, the Magi worshiping the child. The second was the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism. And this is the third and final epiphany in the New Testament. God speaking to the inner circle of Christ's disciples. We know this is an important event. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give an account of it in their Gospels. And as we think about where we are today, let's take a brief look at the timeline. Because just prior to today's scripture reading, Peter had been given the revelation that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And Jesus had announced to his disciples that he would have to die and be raised on the third day. You know, speaking of Peter, you know, that reminds me. Have you guys ever watched like a movie or read a book or something that had a lot of characters in it? And somehow through the course of the reading, you identified with one of those characters. Y'all know what I mean? Holly and I had just finished watching uh, the third season of the Chosen series. Someone from here, and I can't remember, it might have been Miss Diane, recommended it to us. It's, if you're not familiar with it, it's a multi-season show about Jesus' life. It's totally crowdfunded. Um, it's historical fiction, though. So what they do is they take real events that happen in Jesus' life, and then they write kind of a fictional story to try to tell how we got to that point. So just if you watch it, realize it is fiction, but not all of it is fiction. It's well done. They're hoping more people will come to know Christ because of their work. Uh, so far, they've reached about 108 million people, and they're hoping to reach a billion. Uh, if you want to see it, if you can't find it streaming, you can get it directly off their website, which is angel.com. Anyway, I share this because in the depiction of this series, as well as many of the other movies that we see about Jesus and his disciples, they don't always show 
the disciples in the way that I see them in my mind's eye. Yeah, in the in the chosen, Peter's a person of average height and kind of average build, and I've always seen Peter as big and burly and imagined this guy for years throwing that net and working the fishermen. So the shows don't always reflect what I see in my mind's eye. And of course, there's no reason for me to think that I'm correct, but that's just the way I've always seen them. And reading the scriptures, I have always identified with Peter. No, not the Peter after the resurrection that led the church. No, 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 I'm not talking about that Peter. I'm talking about the early Peter. Quick temper, brash, impulsive. Quick to say something before he thinks. Quick to act before he thinks. I can identify with that. And here at the Transfiguration, he still shows some of that impulse to feel the need to say something. But more on that in a moment. So Jesus has chosen three of his disciples, three of his closest disciples for this special honor to go up on a mountaintop with him. And as they're on the mountain, two great men appear, long dead, Moses and Elijah. Moses, who had stood up to Pharaoh and led the Israelites out of slavery. Elijah, who stood up to the prophets of Baal, at Mount Carmel. Those were two of the greatest people in Israel's history. For those disciples, that would be very much like Abraham Lincoln appearing here and George Washington appearing over here before us. People of great statute. And if you think about it, Moses represents the law. And Elijah represents the prophets. And they're speaking to Jesus. We know from some of the other, other books that they're talking with Jesus about the task that lays before him. And if you think about it, it is literally the law and the prophets that Jesus is speaking to. The same law and the prophets that he said he had come to fulfill. And then as Jesus' face it begins to shine right as the sun and his clothes become dazzling white and it's very obvious that God is now in their midst. Now, my good buddy Peter, he could have responded to this in several ways. He could have said, oh my, this is holy ground. He could have said, thank you, Jesus, for bringing us to this place. He could have kept quiet and bask in the moment that was in front of him. But we all knew Peter well enough to know that he couldn't do that. You could always count on Peter in this time period to say something or to do something. He reminds me a little bit of the Energizer Bunny. Always in motion, always got to be doing something. So atop the mountain, in this special moment, Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Okay, this is probably not Peter's finest moment. Luke actually puts a subtext in that says he didn't know what he was talking about. Okay? It's not his finest moment. And then just after he says this, up there engulfed in a bright cloud, and a voice within the cloud says, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And the disciples fall on the ground face first in fear. They're afraid, but this is truly a graceful moment. God could have easily said, shut up, Peter, you talk too much. Jesus could have said, that is the stupidest idea. But nobody said it in kind. God simply says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And I think that's a good idea. And I think that message is directed at not just those three disciples. <coughs> I think listening to Jesus is one of the smartest things that we can do. <coughs> Excuse me. And closing our mouths and opening our ears 
to stop talking a little bit and to start listening. Peter's not going to get good at that until after the resurrection. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Um, I mean, think about it. He jumped out of a perfectly good boat to walk on water in a storm, only to, at the last minute become afraid and start to sing. When Jesus told him he was going to Jerusalem, basically for his passion, Peter jumps in front of him and says, Oh, no, no, you're not. Again, not his best moment. When they come to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out his sword and cuts the ear off of the uh, high priest servant in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter was definitely a type A. And he's a type A, and I, I, I can tell you about type A's. I was born in that way. I've tried to hone it down. I, I hope I've got you believing that this wasn't really me. But it's difficult when you're a type A. You just want to react. You want to do something. But friends, my purpose today is not to pick on Peter. I have great respect for Peter. What I really want to do today is I want to step back for just a moment before Lent begins and let's look at the bigger picture of what's going on here. Why did Jesus tell the disciples, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. I always wondered that. I always wondered when he performed a miracle, he often would tell the person, don't tell anyone. You know, keep it quiet. And to answer that, I think we need to look at how Jesus' overall message was being sent out and how it was being really understood by the people. So like I said, as we begin the season of Lent, we already know what awaits Jesus and his followers. We have a big advantage over them. Because in the words of Paul Harvin, we already know the rest of the story. They're going to be in hiding. They don't understand what's happening yet. They're going to need something to hold on to in that time between Jesus' death on the cross and that Sunday morning when he is risen. They're going to be in hiding. They're going to be feeling ashamed because they abandoned Jesus. They're in fear that the authorities are coming after them next so they're behind locked doors. Peter will have the added guilt of having denied Jesus three times. Now, I've never read this anywhere, but personally, I think that the inner circle of disciples is invited up to this mountaintop in park to give the strongest of Jesus' dis dis disciples something extra to hold on to during those three days of misery that they're going to be experiencing, to prevent them from doing something rash in their mourning, a la Judas. One scholar made a good point, Fred Craddock, who I quote often, he made this observation. He said that given heaven's attest that two attestations, he's referring to the voice of Jesus as baptism and the voice of the transfiguration. He said one might anticipate that a confirming voice would come just one more time, appropriately at the cross. But it did not. And the crowds were persuaded that Jesus, without heaven's voice, and without a divine rescue from the cross, they came to believe that he was not from God. You see, the people didn't understand what was happening. Neither did the disciples. Not even the inner circle. So in verse 7, Jesus comes to his disciples, puts his hands on them, and says, Get up. Do not be afraid. You know, if you read through scripture, very rarely do you ever read that Jesus came to somebody. It's always they come to Jesus. But in this case, Jesus goes to his disciples, just as he will at the end of Matthew's book when he gives them the Great Commission. From all the scholars that I've read, no one has any reason to believe that these three disciples understood what was going on at this time. And so I used to wonder why Jesus told them. 
You know, tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. I mean, if I'm one of those other nine disciples, as soon as these three cats come down the mountain, I'm going to be getting them over here. What happened? What happened? Why are we all gone so long? You know, how do they respond to that? They're not supposed to speak about it. If you think about it, the disciples followed Jesus almost every day for three years. They were constantly with him, and they didn't understand what was happening until after the resurrection. That being the case, there's certainly no reason to assume that the crowds are going to understand anything. Simply hearing a sermon or two or seeing a miracle or two is not going to give them the insight into God's plan of salvation that's being carried out here. For the crowds, Jesus predicting his upcoming passion would have been a very contraindication to the term Messiah and Son of Man. They're still expecting a military leader. His death on the cross even more so. The simple fact was is that the people were not ready for the transfiguration story. The disciples didn't understand it. They couldn't possibly share something that they didn't understand. None of it was going to make sense to them until after the resurrection. And if you've read your scriptures, you know that from this point, as Jesus comes down the mountain, he sets his face towards Jerusalem. He's going to enter as a hero. Only a week later to be rejected, scorned, arrested, beaten, and put on a cross. His focus from this point forward is going to be to train his disciples. He will do very little preaching to the crowd. He will do very few miracles from this point until he gets to Jerusalem. You see, he realizes his time is nearly done. And these disciples aren't near ready. He'll spend most of his time teaching and training them. They're not ready for what's to come. And we know what they're in store for. We're going to be covering that for the next seven weeks. So I'm supposed to promise to I will end today's message with a message of joy, which is what this day is meant to be. I want to leave here today remembering the mountaintop experience. Remember what it must have been like to see Jesus transformed into brilliant light and to see Moses and Elijah appear. And the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. All of us, listen to him. So let's go forth today commemorating one of the most important days in history. One of the most important events in the Gospels. And remembering that it wasn't last Sunday, but this Sunday that we celebrate Super Sunday.